Good morning, everyone. If everyone can take a seat, that would be very appreciated. Um, welcome to the first session of this morning. I am Barbara Bush. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Global Health Corps. And I am very thrilled to be joined by Steve Davis, Yap Boom, and Dr. Atul Gawande for an exciting conversation about moving from innovation to eradication in global health. Or as Steve has famously called it, the unsexy middle in global health. Um, but to start, I have a few housekeeping rules. First, I would love it if everyone could put their phone on silent. Thank you for doing so. Um, and also, we are gonna talk for a little while and then we will have um, the second half of this morning's panel will be open for Q&A from all of you. There will be roaming microphones around and uh, when we get there, if you can introduce yourself to us, that would be great so that we know who we're speaking with. Um, so to frame this morning's conversation, I have dusted off a cliched expression and that is that global health is a marathon, not a sprint. I don't know how many of y'all are runners. Are any of you runners? A handful, okay. Um, I'm a runner and I recently ran the San Francisco Half Marathon. And when I was on mile eight running through San Fran's hills, I had hit a wall. Uh, I was pretty desperate looking for a sign or looking for a friendly cheerleader, a cup of water, really anything to get me going. And if any of you have ever run a marathon, you know that the starting line and the finish line are packed with spectators. They are excited about the starting out, the idea of starting the snap of the flag, um, the bang of the gun, or they are at the end point, the passion and grit of the final miles, um, the relieved look on runners' faces. And yet it's the lonely miles in between when cheerleaders are few and far between that are the hardest to get through because if you don't, you never make it to the victorious end. And thus the similarity to global health, the enthusiasm over new innovations or last mile delivery with the sweaty, messy, often dehydrated in between being overlooked. And yet right now, for any of you that work in global health, you know it's a pretty incredible time to be working in global health. Um, we have vaccines that prevent childhood deaths that a generation or even half a generation ago were fatal. We have cell phones, we have internet on planes, we have medicines, we have information, and we have the technology to keep people not only healthy, but to ensure they live joyful lives. And yet, millions of people die from preventable and treatable illnesses. So why do we have this gap? Well, that is something that we are going to explore this morning. But first, one of the most important tools in addressing this gap is something that we've had all along. And that is great people and great leadership. When I co-founded Global Health Corps in 2009, we sought to build a generation of young leaders who would change the face of global health by not shying away from the middle. Perhaps it is a matter of taste, but we actually find the middle to be very sexy. <laughs> Our crew of young leaders works to fix and rebuild health systems so that they deliver health care equitably. And their work and our work is messy, complex, and hard. The way that we work is we competitively recruit young leaders from around the world who work within health systems or ministries of health. And every day, they learn while doing, while navigating the gray area that exists in global health. And simultaneously, they go through our curriculum focused on leadership development, empathy, and systems thinking. And one of our alumni, Andrew Peterson, recently put it pretty well. He described working in global health as working towards the light at the end of the tunnel, knowing that the tunnel may never actually end. And yet it's worth it because people's lives are worth it. We started Global Health Corps with just 22 fellows and partners in health. There's a number of folks here. We're our very first partner. Um, and now our crew of young leaders is a thousand strong, uh, working every day, impacting healthcare systems around the world. And our fellows um, embody three traits that I think are important for us to think about as we think about this middle ground. And the first is resiliency. Lute Mkala, who I'm looking at, who's right here, um, just a small shout out. I don't know if any of y'all are going to the aha moment session tomorrow, but you should because she's speaking at it. Um, she is a Zambian communication specialist. And last fall, Lute bravely wrote a piece called Confessions of My Failure as an Advocate because the F word, failure, has a bad rep in global health. And yet we all have failures. I think every one of us on this stage can talk about failures. And if we don't talk about them in global health, then we're harming ourselves. 
um, because failures really, they're not endpoints, they're milestones along the way to ensure that we have learnings about better serving others. So therefore, resiliency, getting up, learning from our failures, and making sure that we're being thoughtful about using them when building better healthcare systems. And Lute shared, for me, it is no longer about what my leaders are or aren't doing, but about what I am doing. It's not about casting blame for who broke humanity and created inequitable systems, but about what role I played and continued to play in the promotion of these systems. The second piece that our fellows embody is collaboration. Buzzword, blah, blah, blah. But if you are working and weak in failing healthcare systems, you have to use multi-sectoral approaches. And so at Global Health Corps, we seek out systems thinkers with a diversity of perspectives from all sectors, often outside of the field of global health, who can see the big picture while, while being experts in the details. And this looks like two of our very first fellows named Amit and Jafari. When Amit joined us, he was a recent grad from UC Berkeley. He was 26 years old. He was working for the Gap. He was working on their genes supply chain, getting genes from Gap warehouses into Gap stores. He joined Global Health Corps, was partnered with his co-fellow Jafari, who was working for the biggest cell phone company in Tanzania on their supply chain. And weeks after leaving their jobs, these two were tasked to do for the one million people living on the island of Zanzibar that they had been doing for customers. But this time, instead of getting jeans and cell phones from warehouses into stores, they were getting drugs from warehouses into clinics and more importantly, into the hands of the patients that need them most. So they were working directly in this middle because having interventions, having drugs, it doesn't really matter if you have them if they never reach the people that they are meant to serve. Amit and Jafari now continue to work directly in this middle. Um, Amit moved to Sierra Leone when the Ebola crisis broke out, and he's working on partners in health supply chain there currently. And Jafari was hired by the Ministry of Health in Zanzibar, where he oversees the supply chain that he was once a fellow working on. And then lastly, although we're talking about post-innovation, innovating in the middle, innovating within systems themselves can have a huge outcome. Um, Christian Benamana is a Rwandan architect with Mass Design Group. And he and 16 of our Global Health Corps fellows who are young Rwandan and American architects worked with Mass on the design of Partners in Health's Butaro Hospital. And there they redesigned a healthcare system itself to be focused on patients and their experience. Um, they used their design skills to change the way that air flows so that tuberculosis or other infectious diseases don't spread to whoever walks in the door. So they actually redesigned the system itself and a building itself that can keep people healthy. Um, so these are just three of the many traits that our fellows embody, but for us, resiliency, collaboration, and patient-centered design thinking are critical approaches that we've learned in building leaders that will embrace the middle and that are willing to work within the middle to affect change. And I'm thrilled now to turn to these three fabulous leaders that I have on the stage with me to build off of these ideas and learn about their work working in the middle. So thank you, Dr. Gawande, Yap, and Steve for joining us. I'd love it if you could all join me in welcoming them. So thanks, guys. Um, to start off, I was hoping that each of you could tell us a little bit about what you do, and more importantly, why you do what you do. You want to give it a shot? Sure. Well, my name's Steve Davis, and I'm the CEO of PATH, and I've been um, uh, well, first of all, I'm a little concerned that I, I, my legacy is my unsexy middle comment. It's a great um, legacy. But, um, but I, I do uh, focus a lot on how do we get um, innovation to scale, and I'm somewhat obsessed with that topic. Uh, and I, uh, PATH, if you don't know it, is a, uh, one of the leaders in global health innovation. We work um, on how to really uh, both innovate but to get to scale vaccines, drugs, diagnostics, tools and devices. And a, a, a lot of our work is actually system innovation, system and financing design innovation so um, uh, very uh, excited to be celebrating our 40th year this year um, in doing that work around the world um, and I've uh, also I teach social innovation at Stanford and focus explicitly on this question of, of advancing and scaling social innovation and how do we think about it differently as as we move forward 
Um, and what motivates me, and I've had a very varied career from Chinese human rights law to um, being an internet uh, pioneer to a variety of other things in my life, but, um, but I, I think when I think about what excites me is you know, using new approaches and new tools to um, address equity issues. Um, and I've uh, kind of spent most of my life worried about the inequities of either civil or human rights, and now I think uh, that follows through in the work we get to do um, with great partners like the folks on the stage around uh, health rights around the world. Excellent. So I'm Yap, good morning everyone. So uh, I'll first thank uh, Jessica uh, who invite me here to come and share and feel the, the dynamic that I felt yesterday during the opening ceremony. So I define myself as an African. An African will look for innovative solution to address the challenge that our continent is facing. And to achieve that, I rely on three main things, which is the first one is research and epidemiology. I work for Epicentre, which is the research arm of MSF, uh, Dr. Richard Borders. And I also teach and mentor young students. I'm a professor in university in Uganda, Cameroon, and also in the US in Virginia. With the aim of uh, building a critical mass of young African researchers who will be able to address the, the challenge we are facing and find those homegrown solutions to our problem. And uh, the last one, I want to define myself as a co-social entrepreneur. Because, co because I've, I've uh, co-founded Camerpad, uh, which is an initiative producing a washable sanitary pad in Cameroon with my wife, and also producing menstrual hygiene education to girls and women who by the time it's happened, ne I've never heard about it. So I'm really motivated by how the innovation can be used by that critical mass of young African people with the support of our partners to challenge the, the, the problem that we are facing in Africa. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Atul Gawande, and I would say, um, so I do three things that seemingly don't stick together. I do surgery, I'm a writer at the New Yorker magazine, and then um, run a center called Ariadne Labs. I've been at Harvard Chan School of Public Health and Brigham Women's Hospital for more than a decade, and in the last five years, we formed it into a center for health system innovation around our work trying to figure out how you work in this messy middle, which is about taking discoveries that already exist, but making sure that they get to, get to the next levels of scale. Um, I call it, um, I trained at a hospital where I was in residency with folks like Jim Kim and, and Paul Farmer at Brigham and Women's, and we would have these conversations late at night in the ICU, and I would say, you guys are solving the zero to one problem. They are the beacon on the hill. Paul's here. That Paul remembers these conversations. That, and and I'd say, you guys are proving how you deliver uh, um, treatment for XDRTB, how you can bring HIV to the poorest in the world. And I was interested in the question of, how do you bring that into existing systems and get ordinary doctors and uh, nurses and clinics in the field to actually follow through and believe in your discovery and then take it to somewhere? So that, um, what, what surgery, writing, and this kind of work had in common that attracted me was that you cannot make any of it happen without attention to detail mm -hmm. and without beginning to grasp what are the most important details. Like, any operation is overwhelming on one level. But you start to discover that if there are three or four or five things that you pay the most attention to all the way through, you make sure those pitfalls don't happen, and you can, you can come out the other end with 97, 98% of the patients doing extremely well. And that just appeals to who I am. <laughs> and the idea that we could take that into other lines of work, that there are points of leverage. Okay, I've got it now from one to 10 clinics. How do I go from 10 to 100 clinics? That is a different innovation problem in of itself. Maybe it's the procurement supply chain that you got to solve there. Now I got to go from 100 to 1,000 clinics. Each of those are innovation opportunities in themselves, points of leverage where we can create tremendous change. Um, and they aren't valued in the same way that first discovery is, it was valued. I do think that's changing, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Well, you're all multitaskers, so that is really impressive. <laughs> um, so I guess building off of that point, and, and for each of you, obviously our panel is about moving from innovation to implementation, and you're each doing that in 
um, different ways within your work. And so one, I'm wondering if you can tell us how your work fits into this. And two, what have you learned um, in that middle ground uh, that could be relevant to everyone in this audience? You want to fire it off? I know you have, we've talked before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of complex pieces, but I guess I became a bit obsessed with, um, when I got into this space more, um, and, and I was um, looking at social innovation for, as a consultant uh, running McKinsey's global work in that area, is um, uh, that there was a fair amount of uh, activity and investment and, and excitement on new innovations and, uh, you know, new tools, new models, new drugs, which is all fantastic. And then there's, you know, even a fairly um, a sophisticated level of thinking, even though the activity and investment is less, on last mile delivery. And, 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 we, and I'm thrilled they're getting celebrated. This, you know, last mile health and others are doing such incredible work. And I, uh, that, that complimentary complementarity was great, but it seemed to me that there's quite a big gap between those two places. Uh, and um, so what is it that we need to do to move things from that, you know, I, I sometimes say from the Silicon Valley garage, I'm a West Coast guy in the U.S., to, um, to, the, um, to, the, to, the, to the last mile in a village in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So we um, have spent a lot of time thinking about that and working on it at, at, at PATH and, of course, with other partners all around the world. Um, some of it is uh, as, as simple as designing for scale. So we, you know, for instance, one of the critical things that we've started doing increasingly is we work on several hundred products in any given year th with partners, um, almost all both industry and government partners. But, you know, starting to say, look, within the target product profile, whatever you're doing, you've got to put a low price point. And, you know, on, that sounds like, wow, that's a no-brainer, but it was actually not a no-brainer. That's not <laughs> how actually science works generally. You don't think about price in the lab. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, pushing, you know, some simple design pr principles, but making them real is, is, is a different matter in terms of complex negotiations and the things you have to do around that. Some of it is um, mapping out the plan, how you're actually going to build the, um, the partnerships. This is actually the, the core topic in the course I teach. Um, uh, in this area is, you know, that you've actually got to put a sort of a real value proposition together early on and keep testing it and challenging it um, and not be satisfied. I mean, you've got to sort of map this out all the way. How could this get to national scale? And, and, and one of the things that um, I think particularly for private sector entrepreneurs who look at this, the, the reality while, you know, tapping into that incredible set of assets and innovation is the road to scale typically leads through government. And, and so how do you actually start forming those relationships early and often mm -hmm. and, and rethinking them? Um, obviously, there's an enormous amount of policy and advocacy work people don't appreciate as part of that scale journey. Um, you know, where do you start influencing and getting engaged in, whether it's a formal regulatory model or often it's even as, you know, ensuring that that, get, that protocol gets, uh, you know, incorporated into the um, national urban health mission, or rural health mission protocols in northern India. I mean, those are critical for us to sort of build capacity around and scale. Um, and so, you know, there's a, a lot of steps. There's a fairly complex framework. Um, and we've certainly um, both done some pretty, I think, been part of pretty extraordinary journeys from, you know, seeing an idea that we need, you know, there's meningitis A in uh, Africa and how do we pull together the right multi-sector partnerships and put a stake in the ground and, and develop a vaccine at 50 cents or less a dose and get it um, at, really with the ministers of health of some of the countries that were the most focused, uh, uh, being a big participant in that conversation, all the way through now, you know, 300 million people have received a very cost-effective vaccine, no cases, and it was pretty much meningitis A, and that part of Africa is no longer a problem. So we've been part of really large-scale um, activity. PATH touches about a couple hundred million people directly every year with its work. So as an NGO, it has a, has a huge scale factor. Um, but we've also been part of all sorts of, you know, failures, right? Where, you know, we put together a really interesting model of taking a fairly simple, I should have brought the, um, the tool with me, a simple uh, a injection device that was developed in our lab which is um, enabling the complexity of filling a syringe and managing it. We said that can be done maybe in a different way if you enable 
um, other less trained people to be able to just take a, a pre-filled plastic bubble with a needle on it and mm -hmm. jab it in their arm, and then you've actually solved a, a, a new problem. I mean, you've actually created more capacity, lower trained people can do it, and it, it really should scale up. Um, so we tried that initially with loxitocin, and it turns out that you know, we didn't understand the pricing model well enough, and so we pushed and pushed and pushed, and it just never had the uptake. Now, the good news about that story, and I think one of the really important pieces, um, one of the five or six things I'm super proud of that we're doing right now is taking that same design tool and then saying, but now we learned the pricing was such a, we didn't do enough economic modeling and planning for demand and supply, and now we've sort of recalculated that, but have taken it as part of the call for more women to have uh, family planning tools to incorporate um, uh, Pfizer's uh, Depo-Provera long-lasting injectable into that same tool. And now we've actually seen it rolled out in a number of countries, and we've seen uh, just in the last year 100,000 women have modern family planning for the first time using this tool. And what's so exciting about it is it enables women to self-inject so they don't have to navigate as the difficult of navigating family planning um, accountability and families and communities. So, so that's an example of like, wow, we failed badly, but we picked ourselves up and we said we've got to keep going back and saying, where's the demand? Where's the value proposition? What's the role of government? How do you build these multi-sector partnerships? And, um, and, and how do you just keep that, you know, I think, you know, to your larger and um, point about your great, we're partners of, um, of, of Barbara's <laughs> team, uh, but is the, it's a lot about resilience and it's a lot about tenacity. And I think that we learned that in both cases. Mm -hmm. I love those examples. Yep. Yes, so in, in our case, when you look at the continuum between innovation and implementation, uh, we are really at the last mile before the implementation. As you all know, MSF is an implementer, responding to crisis and so on. But to improve the quality of their mission, they create epicenter to provide an evidence and to actually answer some question that they find in the field just before the implementation or actually why they're implementing. I'll take some few uh, examples to, to illustrate. So in some of the field where we are working, we are in Africa mainly where we, where we are dealing with malaria, quite a number of our clinicians were complaining that some of the kids, though they have been treated uh, with anti-malarial, were still positive. They were still having malaria according to the test. So they asked, what can we do? Is it the resistance or is it something else? So we went in the field in Uganda, and then we include the 500 children in the, in the trial. And then we realized that out of the two different tests of malaria that have been used, one will remain positive up to one month after treatment, which has a lot of implication. Then providing those scientific evidence to MSF, they were able to shift the, the use of the test as well as the Ministry of Health of Uganda, which changed the guideline. The same thing for treatment, as uh, Uganda is a country with a high burden of tuberculosis. The duration for a treatment is like eight months, which has impact on the adherence to treatment for, by the patient. So one question that MSF was also asking is, is there a way we can actually shorten the treatment? And so that from eight months to four months, by increasing the, the dose. Of course, it, it will appear easy, but you need to find out whether it will imply a challenge with safety, with adverse event, and so on. And we did prove that actually by increasing the dose, you reduce the treatment, but you don't increase the severe event. And then we prove it in people with tuberculosis only, and now we are on the way of showing it in people having tuberculosis and HIV. So those evidence we also help to change the guideline and help MSF to change the policy for treatment. The, the last one, which uh, example uh, I will take to illustrate, is something that we actually do, did with, uh, with PATS. It's uh, the rotavirus. It's another virus which is more, uh, let me say, important as compared to Ebola, which has all the breakthrough and, and all that. Rotavirus called diarrhea, and it killed more than 1,000 children every year, every day actually, in the world. And there is, uh, it's a preventable disease, so there are vaccines that can be used to prevent uh, the disease. The challenge is that uh, the vaccines that were used were need the cold chain for transportation and storage. Mm -hmm. And just imagine a country like Niger, a very poor country with temperature as high as 40 degrees, so there is no way they can use the cold chain. And the Serum Institute of <laughs> India, together with PATH, uh, develop a uh, heat-stable vaccine. So the question that MSF asks us, how safe and efficient is that vaccine? 
So we went in Asia and then we included uh, more than 5,000 uh, kids. And then we were able to provide a scientific evidence uh, a week ago in the New England Journal of Medicine that actually the vaccine, though it's uh, used in those conditions, is safe and have a good efficacy. So you imagine the number of kids that will now be vaccinated after, of course, the WHO endorsement and so on, and then they will be able to be protected against those uh, deadly diseases. But it doesn't always work like that. I mean, we, uh, Ebola is a very good example. Uh, we were working on the Ebola vaccine, and then you are having all the, the media in, in, uh, interesting thing, and then we did the study. But even now, the vaccine is still not licensed, and I don't think it will happen this year. So after the, the TV and the media are out, it still takes a long, long, long time, yeah. and then we still find a way to, to push it. Thank you. I want to follow up on that in a second. That's but... the unsexy part. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the... the um... I'm going to try laying on you the framework that's slowly been developing in my mind because I'm trying to make sense of like where you're tackling and where you're tackling and where I'm tackling and where you are. And here's the thing that I feel like is the pain of all of this. It's human beings. It's, it's like those <laughs> damn people that we have to deal with, right? <laughs> and so the problem is that the knowledge that we're trying to deliver is so complex, like what's in the cold chain and how I get everybody to get to do it and you're not doing the right thing and that whole problem. <laughs> And, um, and I think the reality of it is we're all trying to figure out how to make groups successful at delivering knowledge. And fragmented groups don't work, and coordinated groups do, and that's where the concept of a system comes, comes in. And I had a framework that came from a guy named Alan Foster, who's a business guy, who um, said, you know, to make groups successful, uh, there are three things you end up needing. One is whether they all understand what the priority is. Mm -hmm. Can they all say, we agree on the priorities. If they can't, you're done. Yeah. You're already done. You haven't even started and you're, you're done. Second, if you agree on the priorities, who, do you have the right people? The who are gonna get that work done. And then the final part is, are they in a good relationship where they're all pulling in the same direction? If they're all pulling on the chain in the same direction, you suddenly get incredible We've all had those moments in our lives, right? You had everybody clear on the priorities. You had all, everybody working. You were the right people in the room. And you all suddenly pulled in the same direction. And it was effortless. Mm. Stuff happened. And yet we only get that in moments of time. Even in our best circumstances, we get a little like pull for a month and then like, what happened? That was beautiful. Um, and so it's, you know, most of our work, I think, is around that last part, how you get people in a good relationship where they're pulling in the same direction. And... I think the really unfortunate thing is about systems is they're not additive. You've solved one problem, and it doesn't mean that the next problem is solved. Mm -hmm. And when you're pulling on that chain, it's only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. And that is the problem with systems. Mm -hmm. So in that chain, I've come to think of that as also having three components. There's leadership, there are tools, and there are incentives. So you're working on leadership because you feel like in the places where you're working, that is often the weakest link in the chain, the missing element. And then what you all started talking about were some of the tools, and I, that's often where I work too, that the tools that are missing may be um, a, uh, a tool like a technology, like a vaccine. Uh, it's often, to me, it's processes like a checklist or um, a very simplified way that you can make it so everybody understands what they each should be doing in a communication system. Critical is data about measurement. You need a measurement feedback system, and so you need that kind of learning loop. And then the last part is that people won't follow through on them if they don't have incentives in the right direction. So where the space I've ended up in is, you know, I am focused on healthcare where in much of the world the talent is there. And you have some of the hardest working, smartest people willing to do this kind of work. And, and dedicated to it. And we're also seeing a major shift in, in incentives, especially in the higher income parts of the world. We're getting away from fee for service. We're starting to learn how not to just pay for quantity, but start to pay for quality. And so there's a bunch of people around the world, including you know, at the World Bank, people like Jim Kim, thinking about moving us to results-based financing and other things. But we get frustrated because it don't work very well. And I think it's because people lack the tools in the middle. So as those incentives come in, what are we supposed to do if I had the right incentive 
to reduce deaths in childbirth or reduce deaths in surgery or make sure we give people a decent end of their life that is humane and doesn't um, uh, just increase their suffering. And so that's the framework I tend to bring. And I, and I feel like we're all working along. You know, we've all got our weak link in the chain that we see in the places where we work. And we just, you know, we're surgical. We go there. And you, you try to fix that link. And then you fix it, and you're like, oh, crap, there's another weak link. <laughs> Definitely. Well, um, something that comes to mind that has not come up necessarily is as we're thinking about the system is ideally the people that are being served by the systems that we're talking about. Um, and so I'm curious, as we're thinking kind of big picture up here, how do each of you incorporate feedback or each of you design for the human being that a system is meant to accompany um, to make sure that the system is actually being built for who it should be rather than being theoretically built up here? Uh, I'd love to hear from any of y'all on that. Well, go ahead. Yes, maybe yeah. I, I will start. I think it's, um, it's a very challenging thing, uh, the position of the end user in uh, whatever innovation and implementation we have. And I will just ask you for one minute to imagine that uh, here in, in Oxford, there is an outbreak of a very deadly uh, flu, and there is no vaccine, and there is no drug. You imagine the chaos. That, that, could, that could happen. And then you have a team of people, of researchers coming from Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, and Congo, and they tell, well, we have a vaccine that we've tested in people in our country, and it's safe, though the people were not exposed to the disease. And then we test also in a couple of monkeys who are having the disease, and the vaccine works, and so on. And we would like to help you. We would like you to use the, that vaccine, and then, uh, make sure that it saves the people. And then I'm wondering what you think will be the position of the British government? Will they just welcome that vaccine or not? My feeling is that they won't. One of the reasons is that they've not been part of the innovation process. So if it does not, it can't work here, why do we expect it to work in Africa and in many of those countries? What I'm trying to say is that we have to make sure that the people where we are delivering the innovation, where we are doing the implementation, are part of two processes. The first one is the innovation, so that we have the feedback. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the decision making. How many of the social uh, entrepreneurs or philanthropics have African people living in Africa part of their board? I know Steve uh, does, but how many of those? Because then the people who are there will ensure that what you are doing is, one, relevant to the environment. You are talking about priorities and incentive. But the second thing is also a sense of ownership. When I'm involved in something, I will push my fellow people, politicians, and all those people to ensure that our initiative takes place, it's been implemented. So it's critical when we are trying to develop our board and our activity to ensure that it's all the time that people from where we are working involved at the higher level of decision, which unfortunately, even in MSF, is not always, mm -hmm. always the case. And so, did you want to jump in? I would just build on that just to say, I think what you're describing is the lack of voice that people have. And healthcare is particularly weak in that respect, mm -hmm. right? That, um, that the patient, the, um, the citizen, feels they have no voice in how they're treated in the health system, what their opportunities are, how it works, any, any of those kinds of things. And we're only just learning how to, how to actually create voice. I think some of the tools for doing that are incredibly important. So there are the ways that we incorporate those voices into our planning and doing and things like that, but that's still at a very weak level. A lot of what um, we've been working on at our center at Ariadne Labs has been methods of getting more voice. So for example, in primary health care, um, it doesn't matter whether you're in the United States or in uh, middle-income country or in low-income country, people basically don't have, it is a black box, what happens when you go into a center. And the only voice that people have, and you see it in the low-income countries, is exit. Mm -hmm. That is, you just don't go. So, um, you know, we're, we've been doing, uh, uh, we've been partnering in a group called the Primary Healthcare Performance Improvement Coalition, which is uh, the World Health Organization, World Bank, uh, Ariadne Labs is a technical partner, a couple of uh, other great groups. And we've been um, pulling data together that many of you know about, which indicates that, uh, that at primary health clinics, 
uh, whether it's India, Nigeria, ha Haiti, the number of people showing up in the clinic on a given day are incredibly small. Like, you know, my story I always heard from doctors is we're crushed and we're busy, but actually we're seeing like six to 10 people per day turning up in these places. And it, part of it is if there's no one there when you first arrive, uh, you know, like if the absenteeism rate is 30%, you aren't coming back a second time. And then if you're not treated well, and so that what happens when you walk in a clinic is a black box. And we've started putting data around that. So Jishnu Das at the World Bank has started setting mystery shoppers who just show up and, and you know, if they <laughs> pretend to have diarrhea and see what happens. And lo, lo and behold, two thirds, uh, first of all, there's, you know, people aren't there when they are there. They, um, they barely do an exam. They might do one exam element. They might put a hand on a belly. And then um, two-thirds of the treatment is incorrect. You will walk out with a steroid and an antibiotic, neither which is related to what you, mm. that, uh, that affect your condition. So, you know, that's just unlocking the black box. And so now we've started creating simpler tools for capturing this kind of work, including um, now how do I use mobile phones to capture the user experience and then connect it back. We're barely at the beginning of that. We've started using some passive tools in US settings because you don't even know that in US settings, right? Mm -hmm. So we, you know, there's seven sensors on your phone and we've just turned it on for a group at the Mass General Hospital going home um, after surgery. Uh, you know, the, the way we measure is usually your 30 day likelihood of death. Not dying is not what people consider as the highest bar <laughs> of achievement after surgery. So we're now starting to measure how long before you actually get out of your house. Are you able to get a decent night's sleep? Are you able to actually get back and active enough that your brain's working, you're back on social media like you were at your baseline? This is, I think, a huge opportunity in the future is to give people voice by having their user experience brought back in and do it in as low cost ways as we possibly can. Uh, the, the last one I'll point to, we've started using a system called Rewi. Do you, any of you know what Rewi is? Mm -hmm. So Re Rewi, you know how when you type in a, um, type in a, a thing on, uh, in your web browser looking for a site and you inadvertently, it's not Google, you spend, spell it gaugle.com mm -hmm. and you get rooted to some like, this, this link is dead. Rewe is a, is a company that when you get rooted to there, um, they will take a portion of those people and provide a survey. And you can get international information, and we've been able to profile primary care clinic experiences from people going to dead links and giving them surveys. And unbelievably, you can get 20% response rates, and yeah, it isn't like a total cross-section, but it is more information about what people's actual health experience is than you would, than you would expect. Hmm. Love that. So a, a couple just additive points. I mean, hard to, to, to not underscore what they've said as well. But um, just in our kind of thinking about the, 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 if you will, the patient or the beneficiary, we're pretty obsessed by it, um, clearly as a, an organization trying to move the needle on health outcomes. Um, <laughs> But, um, and, and as a result, we're kind of a unique organization in the sense that we have really an end-to-end -end model. And so we have a, a lot of people in labs working in partnerships with industry and, and academic labs around the world, sort of on the upstream of vaccine devices, diagnostics tools, data tools. And we also have the two-thirds of our employees are, you know, generally technical people sitting in 40 countries around the world, working in 70 at any given time, and, and really very much uh, part of those systems um, and, and driving customer demand, understanding what the value proposition is, mm -hmm. testing, giving input. So we try to create that loop um, as an organization. Now, that said, it's a net management nightmare, right? We have matrices within matrices. It's, but we're trying to really break out of what has been the fundamental siloed model of global health and development and say we've got to kind of cross the, you know, we, even in our own organization, plus with partners, we've got to cross over. So these aren't, so we're really trying to pivot from having sort of a project-based model to, to platforms and really ima imagining a much more agile and robust way to do our business through those platforms. So in doing that transition, 
transformation, and that's been a huge transformation lift in the last few years, is one of the aha moments we had that was quite interesting is while we, um, is sort of a conversation about who fundamentally was our customer, and that's a very businessy kind of way to approach it, but, um, you know, and of course the, there was a certain reaction of the cynics of the eye rollers are like, well, you know, the people that fund us, so we're a victim of our funders, which I reject. Um, and, and, um, and then there was, of course, the, it's all about the patient in the clinic or in the, the front line. And we actually started rethinking if our commitment was to get innovation to scale, really our sort of customer had to be, um, and kind of a little bit squishily defined, mm -hmm. the, but the sort of people at the national level, mm -hmm. the both public sector, private sector, and social sector leaders in country, because they were the ones who ultimately were going to implement a design that was going to be able to enable things to scale up, you know, adopt this protocol, introduce this vaccine, mm -hmm. you know, and so we've actually had, it's been an interesting uh, transition as an organization to say the beneficiary end user experience is so central to everything we do but our actual value proposition hmm. is that as at, at the national and not just minister of health but minister of finance minister yeah. of science mm -hmm. and technology and 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 private sector leaders in those countries and and um, and that's changed the the leadership of who we have in country and, and around the world, it's changed the way we do our business. And, and it's quite an, and we think that will help us um, uh, be a, a better partner to, to, to people that are making these choices. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, you just mentioned donors in this space. And I think one reason that this whole panel exists is that um, donors like to fund interventions. It's exciting. Um, they're tangible or they like to fund the last mile work and the middle ground is the long game like we're gonna we're here for our lives basically and so in a good way um, and so I'm curious if you any of you have thoughts on uh, how you move don't you know to your point before about priorities how do you move donors along to see the value of the long game um, and get excited about that piece so that we can really uh, move to eradication in this space one of the ways that we've done it is try to break down the concept of scale mm -hmm. because um, you know the idea that you've had a breakthrough fantastic that's a very tangible thing that that um, uh, anybody government donor can understand uh, investor um, and then get to millions and that's a sort of indefinable um, goal that is a kind of never-ending goal and we've broken it down by sort of saying, you know, every project we have, aim one is get from zero to one, one to 10, 10 to, 10 to 100, and, and track over time, are we making progress in moving up each order of magnitude? Um, our surgery work, for example, we published in 2009 a checklist for surgical teams that was deployed everywhere from rural Tanzania to um, St. Mary's Hospital in London, University of Washington, and, and, and basically, it achieved a 35% um, uh, reduction in complications. Every hospital had a reduction in complications and a 50% reduction in death. Great. That was 10,000 people in 2009. It was very hard to find donors to say, Let, help us get to 100,000, help us get to a million. But in 2012, we found a family foundation who did. And we um, were able to then go by 10x, basically, with each subsequent year. And we now are past 100 million of 300 million operations worldwide, where it is the standard of care, we can see it being done, and we've demonstrated and measured at population level what it takes to be able to deliver it, whether it's Scotland, where we had a 26% reduction in deaths, Moldova, where we've had a 60% reduction in complications. Um, we're coming out with some new results in the state of South Carolina. So the, um, that has been a way to offer the funders and investors a marker of where you're going and also set expectations at an appropriate level. Now, it doesn't always win. I can't tell you how many conversations I had with Jim Kim in which he'll say, how about, you know, zero in five years <laughs> for an entire, you know, continent? Like, how about <laughs> we get from like 100 clinics to a thousand clinics, no. <laughs> but I think this is the way we have to think and deliver, unfortunately. Yeah. We have to send the hard message that it isn't magic. Yeah, absolutely. And yet it is progress. Absolutely. 
Um, we are going to open it up to questions from the audience. I have one more question that I want to ask our panel. Um, so I hope you all can start thinking about what you'd like to ask them. But um, this work is complicated, and systems are complicated, and they're hard. And yet, I'm assuming each of you are hopeful, or you wouldn't be sitting up here. Um, I think it's hard to be glass half empty to work in global health. So I'm curious if each of you can tell us what you're optimistic about or what keeps you hopeful in this space. Well, um, you know, this actually answers in, in, this, in the urgency for more efficiencies, this answers both questions. That, the donor question, which I was going to make the quip that, you know, the only, you know, the, in global health, it would be, it would be really easy if there just weren't people. And there are days <laughs> that I say, and if there just weren't donors. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, and, uh, that's probably my development people would personally. hate that I just said that. But, you know, it, it is a, um, but I think the opportunity that's exciting and uh, optimistic, I mean, first of all, and it's actually the way I, I talk to donors a lot uh, about um, do, helping pull things through this unsexy metal is um, the opportunity uh, in our lifetime that we are experiencing. I mean, the, the progress made in the last uh, you know, 20 years is extraordinary in terms of reductions of morbidity and mortality. The, the, um, the progress we're seeing um, on a daily basis in, in, with data and digital tools and science and technology, the progress we're seeing with political commitments um, we, uh, in, on, on you know, community health workers and, and uh, health system strengthening, I mean, despite the challenges and the outbreaks and the, um, you know, that we're seeing an enormous, enormous uh, momentum. And, um, and, and it's also a momentum that can be measured in some new ways that we're actually, you know, we've eliminated or eradic eradicated one human a disease in, uh, in the world so far in human history. Uh, we're, we're not only close to the number two disease, but we actually have a short list of about eight or nine that we are actively participating and getting donors to actively participate with us on taking these diseases off the chart, literally. And so there are a number of things that, you know, really will make a difference. And I think keeping, particularly in this, uh, in this quote, new normal, we need to keep inspiring young people and young scientists and young uh, global health workers to remember the enormous difference that they're making every day. Yeah. Thank you. I think I, I will just start where, where you just ended, about uh, the young scientists and young people who make a difference. And that's really what uh, motivates me, to have uh, more and more of those uh, young people who are eager to learn, eager to engage them themselves and, and changing the world. Uh, the challenge is coming also from the, the funding because uh, when you want to build capacity, long-term capacity, people want to have an impact uh, right now. Mm -hmm. But for those who are you go in a country like Niger, again, where you need more time, you need more resources to build something. But when you see the change in, in leadership that is happening in Africa, it's something that is really motivating me. Every day I, I, I can find more and more people who are willing to support and willing to make the, the thing change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I won't add too much more to say that actually optimism in global health is easy for all the reasons that you talk about. I mean, that there's been steady progress. Um, and it's by virtue of the work that people are contributing and doing. It's one of the few places where you can put a career in and have full expectation. Yes, in one year, boy, is it painful. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite quotes from Bill Gates is that we, uh, which I've slightly bastardized, but um, that we overestimate what we'll accomplish in two years and underestimate what we'll accomplish in 10. And any of us who've been at it for 10 years or more, it's been incredible what you get to see. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Um, I'd love it to open it up to all of you. If you can raise your hand, I know there's microphones I see a number of questions, and please, um, a microphone will come to you. Why don't we start with these two here and this gentleman up here? Uh, and please introduce yourself so we know who you are. Hi, uh, Jeff Walker, um, MDG Health Alliance. So, system change. It seems to me actually, system change is becoming sexy. Um, Every donor is starting to talk about it, right? Ford Foundation's focusing on systems change, right? Uh, Rockefeller is looking at that and financing. But how do, you, how do you all operate as part of the system, right? You're generating talent, right? Steve's generating innovations, right? Dr. Spine Builders is interventions and emergency 
care, right? The systems change that a tool's been talking about, but everybody's doing their own thing still. You know, I have the data. I know I'm the best NGO that I'm, you know, out there, and you can support me. So pulling these all together so that we can focus on the national change that I think is right. Um, how do we service the ministers of health and finance and, and have them as clients? But the mechanisms still aren't quite in place yet. So where do you think you're fitting in, and do you know your place as opposed to trying to solve all problems and how you fit in the larger system model? Well, I mean, Jeff, I, I, I would sort of do agree and disagree. I, I think that, um, that it is a, a struggle to figure out how we build these sort of collaborative models, particularly with the opportunity ahead of us with better data and knowledge management and knowledge sharing. So that would be a huge step forward. I would say, you know, I think there is a, um, the, the place I would push back a bit is to say, I think most of the organizations I, I know pretty well on the stage and in this room are engaged in deep uh, collaborations every day. In fact, that there's no way we can do the work we're doing without uh, intense uh, you know, collaborations with ministries of health and with governments and industry partners and other nonprofit partners. Um, and, and so uh, you know, I think that we, and, and so there are two things. One is I actually think we're, we have a muscle that we know how to, that, that, that I think it's pretty good. I think we need to understand better the design, so we need more coordination about how to bring those muscles to bear. It's not an intrinsic resistance. It's about how do we, you know, so when we've identified an opportunity or problem, I was part of this sort of, for instance, the CEPI uh, conversation uh, in the last two years, and you know, that was a good example of we found and identified a problem, we built something, whether it works or not, we'll see, but, but I think there's a, a way to, that goes about it. I, I also think that, I don't know the experience of others, but we're no longer seeing ourselves. Now, we don't think we can tackle everything. We're, we're, we are saying no to a lot of things, and we are absolutely um, strategically prioritizing a number of things. But we're also saying we can no longer just play this space. We have to have advocacy people. We have to bring in you know, economists. We're hiring more economists every day. Um, we're, we have to, because otherwise, to get to an outcome-based approach, you can't just play your own, you know, you, you, you've got to build these teams, sometimes internally, sometimes with collaborators. So I also think that it's a matter of sort of structuring the model where you know what your space is, but you're willing to play beyond your usual lane. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd love to jump in just about Global Health Corps. We had the luxury of starting only a few years ago, and there are great organizations and great systems that exist, and so what we're good at is talent, um, and really, what we do is feed great talent into systems that already exist with the intention of refining them. So all, I mean, all we do, it's quite, I don't think there's anything innovative about bringing great talent to a field that needs more talent, but our fellows work within systems and regularly the opportunity that they have is to step out and be with each other. So they're with, you know, 750 other fellows and alums that are working within ministries of health and systems um, and they have the luxury of stepping away for a week with each other to see what role each of them plays in the system and then can go back in. And I think that often that is what is missing is we're all so heads down because we need to be because health matters and people's lives matter. But if you don't have the chance to step out and see everyone else in your ecosystem and figure out how to work together, it's hard to do so. And yet it's not a luxury to build that in. It actually creates efficiencies within a system. I'll, I'll step into agree with Jeff, <laughs> um, which is, I think we have, from the perspective of you're a government or your private sector health system, where do I turn around our systems failures and our systems problems? And there is no integrator, right? We are a bunch of very small, still, seem, you know, largely small organizations. And I'll give an example of one where uh, I think it's very impressive and it ties in with one of your Skull Fellows this year, which is the building industry. So in the building industry, in the US and Europe, there are a few critical integrator organizations that supply the system knowledge of how you have building codes in your city that are adjusted to what you have. And there are three or four go-to organizations that can help you, if you're a city, want to know how to do everything around your urban planning that has to, has to happen from your building codes to your, to your you know, relationships around your zoning rules and everything else. We, we are so far from that in global health, the, there are no, you know, to the extent we have 
uh, it, it is very difficult to get to become a million dollar revenue nonprofit, and you lose 90% along the way there. Getting to the 20 million or, or so level is a much smaller group, and that still doesn't have the, the, the footprint that you need. Getting to the point that you're at 100 million or, uh, or bigger, short of those being the donor foundations, they, they aren't serving that integration role of saying, we have a go-to place for if you are trying to work on health systems, here's a systematic way of going about it. It doesn't matter whether you're trying to deal with vaccination or you're trying to deal with, you know, the way I described it yesterday, we've discovered that there are 60,000 different conditions a human body, a human faces. We, have dis we, we now know 6,000 drugs, 4,000 medical and surgical procedures that can make um, lives better and we have not figured out anywhere how to deploy that capability town by town to everyone alive, not, not in any really single town. So I think this next couple decades could be about how do we create that integrator. Mm -hmm. I think there's someone else down here have, yes. Hi. Hi, I, you know, Jeff, Read, read my mind, um, and I, I actually want to push a little bit more on this. I'm Ari Johnson from Muso, and uh, first, thank you all for the work that you do. And so we're, we're talking about systems change, right? And um, and the essential importance of collaboration to make that happen. We don't get systems change without collaboration. I, I want to just push a little more on that and uh, ask you to explore what are the biggest pain points what are the biggest barriers to collaboration to make systems change happen uh, in global health? And what are some of your ideas on how we can overcome them? So maybe I would say one of the, the biggest barrier to collaboration may actually be the, the donors. Because everyone has its own indicator. So if I'm pushing my NGO to go and address Ebola, for example, I want my people to take care of most people as compared to the other one. So it's very difficult at some point to collaborate, but we compete. So at some point, it's uh, critical to rethink the indicator. If I want to support an activity or to support uh, a disease, let's have the end user, and I go back to that, to coordinate. So the country should be able to say, this is how, those are our priorities. And we want all of you to address that. And who can do this, 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 and that? So that they actually push us to collaborate and not to compete. Mm -hmm. And I, I was actually going to add a, little, a couple pain points, one being um, you know, uh, the sort of the project-based funding model has gotten repeatedly shorter and shorter cycle times. And, um, and I think that's a real miss. Um, it, it, it pushes a narrower set of indicators. It usually pushes a bunch of diverse indicators that there's no alignment on. Um, and it honestly doesn't allow for much risk or failure. And so um, I think that short-termism we see in other parts of our markets are, is, is having some of the same uh, negative impact. And I think if we could take a longer view, we'd mm -hmm. take a longer view to the problem. But actually, you'd bring more collaborators in. Mm -hmm. because. I think the other is, in, is a part of a, a leadership pain point, and I could name a few others, but is um, I uh, advocate kind of this, uh, and there's some actually interesting research on uh, leadership, uh, multi-sector or tri-sector leadership, that people who, it's, it's one thing, because most of these solutions are going to be only um, actually achieved in country or around the world if we actually bring public, private, and social sector players together to solve um, to collectively. Um, and yet, there may be good intentions for that, but actually, there's just a huge gap. If you've never, you know, to say, to, you know, I say we should have people that know what the SDGs and the PNL are all in the same breath. And we don't have many. I've tested that. You know, we'll have a half the audience know what a PNL is, half the audience know what the SDGs, the other half don't. And, and, and so we need more people that have actually trained and actually worked so they can understand not just incentives, but culture and life cycle, time cycles. Because one of the problems we're having is the transaction costs of uh, the transaction costs are growing with this 
in, increased number of in, interested donors, increased number of indicators, increased num a shorter life cycle of these projects, and therefore we're spending our money and, and frankly precious resources too often the wrong way, which I think mm -hmm. is getting in the way as well. Mm -hmm. I think what that speaks to is um, when I think about the biggest pain point, it really is that we don't agree on the priorities. Um, and you can't get collaboration if you're, whether it's the donors, the governments, um, you, you, you have a very hard time getting off the ground to even start to create collaboration if you aren't actually all aligned about what you're trying to do. I mean, in the United States, you know, we, we still are battling over whether we have an agreement that it's a priority to provide everybody with at least subsistence level health care. Like, if we can't even agree on that, you can't even, like, begin to have collaboration between government, NGO, and, mm -hmm. and uh, academia, and, and, and everything else. So, um, and, and that's replicated in, in almost every part of the world as part of the democratic process, right? And so th the collaboration has to be around certain values, and not everybody shares mm -hmm. those values. If we can agree, okay, a subset of us agree on the values, then, then we're off and off and, run, off and running, and then just trying to decide how much pain comes from coordinating amongst everybody versus let's all fold under one umbrella. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to thank everybody, all the panel for this. This has been a wonderful discussion. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm asking, and this is Scott Haldeman from the World Spine Care Program. What I'm curious about <clears throat> is what you do with <clears throat> a situation where the uh, <clears throat> beginning line is not sexy, the middle is not sexy, and there's no substantial end point. <laughs> The end word is soft. Now, I'm talking about disability as opposed to death. We now know the world's uh, uh, WHO global burden of disease has shown that disability is greater than death as a burden, and non communicable diseases are, are more serious than communicable diseases. And we've just heard that more infectious diseases are going to be destroyed uh, by Steve and get lived. <laughs> Go, learned, Steve! That Yap is going to destroy get rid of all out uh, disasters. <laughs> and so what we're wondering is how would you deal with, dis uh, with disability, which is mostly musculoskeletal, neurological, and mental? And so how do we get involved with that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's probably, uh, I, I had to give a speech yesterday in Paris, and I was trying to sort of, where, what were some of the biggest trends in global health and global security? And, this, this pivot, um, uh, the positive trends, of course, we're seeing you know, the world demographics change in a very positive way. The, the negative, the, one of the most frightening is the, is the, um, the it's both the, tr the, the burden of disease shifting to NCDs, and, but also just the awareness level going up, yeah. which is a good thing, but that means we have, we're finally grappling with the fact that mental health is part of our, our, our agenda and, and, and some of those challenges. And you know, I think it's one we're really wrestling with because it is a different endpoint. It also has a different set of conditions to affect behavior, um, and and we don't have any magic. There's not, you know, it's not like the magic of vaccines plays out when mm. you're dealing with diabetes. Um, I think the other thing that we're really struggling as a community with is the just the myth, myth busting of the fact that a lot of these issues um, have been sort of in the sort of layman's view, um, diseases of the affluent, right? And now we're recognizing with data after data after data that points that actually these NCDs and mental health and other conditions are actually much worse in, uh, uh, disproportionately affecting the low resource settings and the poor. So we, we've got a, a big challenge. You know, to, so I don't, I'd throw the problem out. I think there are some really important opportunities here as well. First of all, we know more than we ever knew, and so we're gonna mm -hmm. be able to, you know, we're, we're, we're actually focused on, inter, you know, system changes at the community level, and that's where a lot of disability and mental health and other kinds of conditions will have to be managed, and that, and so I think that consciousness of that strengthening means that, that there's a different lever and a different place in the value chain that you have to kind of push those solutions. And then again, I mean, you know, I think one of the things we've also got to work on, um, and now this is less about the disability you were talking about, but in, in broad NCD terms, what we're focusing a lot on is pre prevention, which is the right thing, but the reality is in a lot of the places that we work, there's no treatment for a very common, you know, issue like, you know, people who have been diagnosed with diabetes don't get access to insulin. And so we've got to keep, you know, focused on both sides of that equation. But it's, it's, a, it's one we're all going to be here in a 10 years still struggling how to, how to move a needle on. 
Yes, I will add that to, as today it's a real debate within MSF. It's uh, how do we redefine the crisis and the emergency. So we are thinking about infectious disease and migrant and so on, but now the NCD, the way they are increasing in, in, in most of the country where we are working, it's really uh, scary. And then we are rethinking that, okay, if there is something that is increasing that fast and there are not enough partners, maybe we should actually think about it. And that's what also Epicenter will be doing to provide evidence, as uh, Pat was talking about, evidence that will push MSF to say, okay, it's important to go there as well, first because uh, the, the number are growing, but also because there, there is a need for partners. I'll just say you've put your finger on something that I think has been a real struggle in our group, for example, it's more and more of our work is about not just the survival, but about the well-being and the quality of life that people have. And we don't have a good measure for public health, the end, but it's an opportunity because this is where the finance ministers and leaders and the health leaders uh, start to coincide because there's three different kinds of measures. There's the uh, symptom measures, how much pain, nausea, fatigue, et cetera, do you have in your life? There's the function measures, can I, uh, can I work, can I ambulate, can I you know, handle my own finances, can I do those kinds of things? And then there's this third very wishy-washy area, which is do I have autonomy and a sense that I'm in charge of my life? Mm. And when we speak about trying to serve people along these lines, we're often conflating all those three or trying to jam them all together. Um, but if we have clarity about it, that, that and, and I think actually this is an opportunity for uh, some researchers here or donors, that we need uh, to have a much crisper, cleaner sense of the outcome we're driving for. It might just be, you know, the independent activities of daily living and how many people get to have those in their life and that's enough. Or, or you know, is it a cognitive thing? Just does my brain work? Mm. Mm -hmm. And how many people have their brain at full function and is that the right measure to arrive at? But there's something along here that's really powerful and I think will start to emerge as um, if we could get a clear metric that, we, that speaks to us morally and as people, um, then I think it will be as powerful as talking about saving people from dying. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for two more questions. I'm gonna try to mix it up on sides of the room. So you, we'll do three. You, you, and you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll keep mine brief. So my name is Julian Coyne. I'm from the Global Engineering Excellence Center, GEEK. Uh, and, <laughs> yes. I'm, a, I'm a computer scientist by background, so that might not be surprising. Now, um, we've been talking about systems change and, and setting priorities here. And um, there's one little vignette I'd just like to share very, very quickly. Our, um, one of our rising stars in, in local politics, where I'm from, Western Australia, broke our state's heart and went into federal politics, but he went into the um, social services portfolio. And we have a reasonably good social services system. Um, we had a bit of a, a presentation from him, 100 days in the job, what had he seen? And to my amazement, the social services uh, portfolio was actually an order of magnitude larger than health, which is what everyone thinks about in terms of big, intractable black holes. And so his first um, day in the job, he said, well, I, I need to know what I'm dealing with here. So can someone do a, a mapping exercise for me of what this animal I've inherited is and, and what it looks like? so we can define our baseline and then our target state from that and, and which way we're, we're mapping and, and priorities and where we're getting to. And it really just comes down to landscape. Now, he had the room in stitches. He advanced his slide deck and the best they could come up with was probably about as big as the screen here <laughs> at about eight point font and it was boxes and arrows and diagrams and it was insane. And he said, look, we need to be thinking outside of this. So maybe just some reflections on Firstly, is, has any, anyone done that mapping exercise or is, in terms of this integrator role, the oversight um, of, of the oversight, if you like, who, who is looking at, who's doubling up on problems? Sorry, I'll stop rambling, but just one really, really funny story is in our capital city in Perth. Um, people are always digging things up and installing new telecommunications pipes or, or plumbing or whatever it is. They made a little app and all it is is it shows who's digging what up on what time of day and gives each other their phone numbers and they've saved an eye-wateringly large sum just with that minimal piece of coordination to know who's doing what where and put two people in touch. Very small piece of work. So I think there's a lot that can be done with, with quite simple tools. 
I'll just jump in to start out by saying that I think we're recognizing in global health um, that social needs are incredibly important to health as an outcome. And so, for example, uh, work in the uh, US around the Housing First movement has, has been a, a field where people have recognized that for the homeless, trying to say that we need to address their alcoholism or their mental health issues or their or their uh, chronic disabilities first before we get them housing, had it all backwards. That as soon as you put them in housing, just by having housing first, their health improved. And that, that as a global health um, direction, is one that ties in with the refugee crisis. It's very clear that you know, a housing first could be part of a global health solution. Uh, but then, you know, do you want doctors and nurses, you ever, you know, expensive, trained, people doing that kind of work. And so the boundaries start breaking down. And I think that's, uh, it's, I won't quite call it a crisis, but it's a stress on how we've really built our models in global health for the reasons you're talking about. And, and one other quick point is, um, I, you know, two, well, one is I think we have to remember there's no one health system, right? There's many, many different health systems, contextual, geographical, state of evolution. Um, and ultimately, in many countries of the world at least, that the, the, the aggregator, the, 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 the orchestrator is the Minister of Health. I mean, so we have to not, not uh, we have to really understand that important role in many countries. Some countries less so. I'm not in one where that's a very dominant role, but there are others. Um, uh, but we, we've actually seen this a lot in the digital area. So, you know, everybody loves the next app, the next tool, the next mm. social media model for behavior change. I mean, it's exciting. I, I was in a meeting with a bunch of health ministers about a year ago where they went on this, actually what was sadly a hysterical rant about, if I see another damn social entrepreneur come in and tell me to implement this program because this donor wants it with this app that's only gonna reach 5,000 people, and th then the next guy, well, you think you have it bad in my country, Bob. And it was this sort of <laughs> sad moment yeah. because you realize all this good intention and all this innovation is getting met with this complete, like, this is actually hurting us. Mm -hmm. This is overwhelming our system. This is hurting us. It's taking us backwards. So places like Uganda have said no more, you know, digital health pilots and a variety of things. So what we've started working with a bunch of people, I mean, public, private, to say, how do we go in and support the mapping of what's going on and then support the minister and the sort of people folks around them around what is the digital health architecture that makes sense in that country. It's gonna be a different one country to country. And then what are the, we don't have any proprietary tools, we don't do any technology, but we're actually helping orchestrate that mm. sort of conversation, landscaping, mapping, um, and, and working with a number of ministers because they're gonna be the ones that ultimately have to manage and monitor that. Mm -hmm. Well done. <laughs> Round of applause. Um, I love your question. Uh, hi, my name is Ryan Cummins. Uh, I co-founded a company called Omaze uh, that raises money and awareness for charity. And one of the things that we found is that the simplicity of the story is one of the number one things for how, how much engagement we end up getting, how digestible it is to the masses. Uh, and we had a chance one time to work with a director named J.J. Abrams who, who said that for a story to really work, the protagonist has to have something that they want with all their heart to have happen and something that will clearly tragically result if it doesn't. And so the question that I have for you guys is if you guys consider yourselves the protagonists of these stories on global health, what is that simple story that you want to have happen with all your heart but the tragedy that will result if it doesn't? MSF, you've got, you've got the master of tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the, the key point uh, to make things work or not in terms of story, it's uh, the leadership of the people who you find in the ground. What I mean is that uh, there is a lot of action that MSF or others have tried to implement. And just because people were not trained, just because people were not understanding actually the benefit of the innovation or whatever was coming down, it just fell. So I think if uh, donors w want to invest in on something apart from the tool that we've been talking about, it's really on how to build uh, cap human capacity in, in those countries. People who will send a voice, uh, as we're talking about, who will tell exactly what they need, and who will able to coordinate all the people who are coming. Because they will have the knowledge, they will have the leadership, 
to be able to make sure that whatever is happening in the environment respond to their priorities. I'll say that in, yesterday when I gave my speech, that was the reason why I put up that very disturbing image of a baby who was blue, you know, barely alive, 15 minutes after birth, and that it wasn't going to be a simple, simple technology that was going to turn that around. This, you know, the, t the technology was that baby needed to be warm skin to skin with the mom, needed to have some basic hygiene and care, and it, the only ways you made that happen was a system, and, I, and that allowed you to build that story. But I do think you have to couple both, that you have to show the tragic consequence, and you have to make it visual for people, and they have to connect with it and see that story, and then see the complexity, and then finally offer that it is tractable. You have to offer a pathway that shows that it can be tractable, because otherwise you're going to come back 10 years later with the same picture is the fear that people have. Mm -hmm. and, and just a couple of quick ones. One is I, you know, I, I joke about PATH is the largest NGO in the world no one's ever heard of. So we have not conquered this problem because <laughs> we have way too complex of a story, you know, and, um, and, and, and with working on so many things. And, you know, so we think of ourselves as protagonists, but we don't even, you know, we're fighting so many battles at once. Uh, so I, I, I kind of go back to kind of a level of honestly of outrage. Um, you know, I, I find it absolutely outrageous that so many women in the world are dying of cervical cancer. Uh, there's absolutely no legitimate reason for that, and we know how to prevent it, we know tools, and so I think the thing we got to fight against is that outrage should lead us to say that's not okay, and just, you know, implore, you know, with every tool and every mm -hmm. muscle we have to say, we're, we've got to change that. There's no reason. That it's, it's, we know how to handle this. And there are a number of things like that, where there are preventable diseases or preventable deaths or preventable disabilities that we could actually manage differently. And that outrage is sort of our core kind of, it's an, the inequity in that is what drives us. Yep. Um, I want to be mindful of time because sessions are starting in about one minute. So we're going to have a many, many question to wrap up. Okay, and maybe this is something that we can discuss another another time. Fabulous, we can discuss over coffee. Yes, sounds good. But um, just I just wanted to you know quick ask. I was at a meeting yesterday with some executives from the pharmaceutical industry, trying to think about new models of pricing. You know, and I'd love to hear. And maybe this is offline, but you know, what new approaches, technologies, you know, have you seen effectively align the interests of patients and pharmaceutical companies? Um, I think. Yeah, be very interested in hearing. That's him. Yeah. Well, that's a huge question. And, and look, there's, you know, there, we partner with every one of them in, in big ways. Um, I, I do think there are um, mechanisms like, and I won't get into it, but global access models where you're actually supporting their investment into patents and technology that can go forward. But if you create that mechanism so you bargain your investment into that work against a price cap and a price of 20 year you know algorithm for a price cap for a you know on that tool in certain low resource settings is a is a mechanism that has had some effect that's how rotavirus will work yeah. and so i you know but there that's a lot of pieces to that puzzle so maybe y'all can chat after this um thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us please join me in giving our wonderful panel a round of applause Thank you. Oh, and if everyone can fill out the form in front of them, final housekeeping duty. <laughs>